So without further delay, let me start my presentation. Let us first talk about the so-called elephant in the room. Uh, we are going to talk about pre-cancer and cancer. Uh, the first thing that you need to know is there are a lot of terms which are used as a substitute for pre-cancer. You have pre-malignant lesions. You have journals talking about epithelial precursor lesions. You have potentially malignant disorders, which is widely accepted at this point in time. And just to make your life easy, you have the potentially pre-malignant oral epithelial lesions that just creep into the literature. So these are all terms which essentially mean pre-cancer. And uh, I'm going to use the term potentially malignant disorder or more specifically, oral potentially malignant disorder in this presentation. So what, what do you, what are you going to take away from this uh, discussion here today? Hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll understand why it is very important. What do you need to know clinically to manage patients? What are the histological problems the pathologist faces, both in diagnosis and his or her interaction with the clinician? And most important for the patient, which of these lesions turn malignant? What are the malignant potential of these so called precancerous lesions? So, why is OPMD or oral potentially malignant disorder that important? This is very, very important for all clinicians and practitioners to know. OPMD or oral potentially malignant disorder precede most of the cancer, <clears throat> at least those associated with habits, which is the most common cause in this part of the world. The next thing which you have to be very careful about is those lesions which present as OPMDs clinically could be cancers to begin with. So OPMDs may be early cancers. I shall show you a few pictures in a few minutes. And The screen has been cut off. Can you see me? Yeah. I think we just skipped them. Okay. So it's okay. back, sir? Yeah, we are back. We are back. And asymptomatic cancers are more likely to be diagnosed in the dental setting. So these are the three important reasons why dental surgeons have a very important role in the preventive aspects of oral cancer. Okay, what is what exactly is our goal? By the time you look at the slide in the screen, the patient present with this sort of lesion, it's already oral cancer and probably going to be too late to do any conservative work. The whole idea is to catch them early on. You catch them at the leukoplakia stage, the erythroplakia stage, or the oral submucous fibrosis stage before they become cancer. And that's what this presentation is going to focus on. So why exactly do you need to catch them early? This is the often quoted fact. And for those of you who are beginning in pathology or beginning in practice should know this. A diagnostic delay means there is an increased risk of recurrence increased morbidity and mortality as far as oral cancer is concerned. And in oropharyngeal cancer, a professional delay of one month, just one month, would mean a difference of stage one cancer where the prognosis is very good, and almost 90 to 95 percent recovery rate, to stage four where the prognosis is very dismal and chances of survival are less than five percent. A period as small as one month, a delay in one month would make a very big difference to the patient and the prognosis. Well, we need to know a little bit about cancer. I'm going to give you a very, very brief statistic about this. The first thing to realize is when we say cancer of the head and neck, it's a heterogeneous group. It's heterogeneous as far as etiology is concerned, its molecular nature is concerned and its genetic profile, its prognosis, and the management protocol. So you have the classic oral cancer, which we talk about in India, because of the habit, tobacco, areca nut, and related substances. The oropharyngeal cancer, which is HPV-related, 
for the most part. And cancer of the lip, which is associated with actinic insult and exposure to sun. Oropharyngeal cancer is the 11th most common cancer globally. And unfortunately, in developing countries, two out of every three cancer happens to be oral cancer. And in high incidence areas where habits are rampant, tobacco and arikana, like in India, with this top three as far as cancer is happening. Why is oral cancer such a big problem? This is the reason. The five-year survival rate is around 50%, in spite of huge leaps and advances in management protocol and treatment protocol. This is essentially because invariably diagnosed late. And this is really ironical because the oral cavity actually lends itself to screening procedures very easily. And it is unfortunate that in spite of this advantage, these patients are diagnosed very late with a very dismal prognosis. It's not only late diagnosis, people with oral cancer have an increased risk of multiple tumors. Uh, the incidence is as high as 17 to 30 percent, and the annualized risk is about 3 to 10 percent. And this is from a very, very seminal article way back. Uh, now, I want you to concentrate on the two fields the second field tumor and the second primary tumor. Now, this is another major problem. What does this indicate? Patients with oral cancer have a 20% higher chance of developing a second cancer. And this risk can last as long as five to 10 years after the primary cancer. If you have an oral cancer, and even if you are treated, or the patient has an oral cancer and they are treated and cured, they still have a 20% risk of developing a second tumor, a second primary tumor, or a second field tumor. And this risk is for as long as five to 10 years, which means in a clinical context, you have to follow these patients up for a very long period of time. Okay, let's come back to uh, pre-cancer or orally, oral potentially malignant disorder or OPMD. In the ideal world, normal mucosa should progress to OPMD, which over a period of time should go to cancer. Under OPMD, you have leukoplakia, erythroplakia, oral submucous fibrosis, erosive lichen planus, and other lesions like reverse smoking, actinic chelitis, discoid leukos erythematosus, dyskeratosis congenita, and less common lesions. But what happens in real life is, a lot of times, all the potentially malignant disorders do not become cancer. In fact, the malignant transformation rate is around 1.5 to 0%. So the question is, how do you predict which of these potentially malignant disorders are going to be malignant and you need to treat them aggressively and which of them you can watch, follow up, or treat conservatively? And that's the important question that we have to offer. There's another paradox. A lot of times, you do not get a precursor lesion like an oral potentially malignant disorder, a leukoplakia or erythroplakia. And you get situations where an apparently normal oral mucosa progresses. And now we have newer techniques, newer clinical techniques, autofluorescence, and things like veloscope to screen normal oral mucosa so that we catch them very early on, especially in patients with expensive habits and very intense habits like tobacco, areca nuts, a combination of these multiple times. A few clinical aspects of OPMD. Uh, you get a wide variety of uh, leukoplakia. Leukoplakia is the most common, so I shall use that as an example. You get thin, ectic or homogeneous, nodular or granular, verrucous, speckled, and proliferative verrucous leukoplakia. And then you have lesions like hypoplasia and oral submucous fibrosis, which is a potentially malignant condition, which Professor Roshna and Professor Tilak are going to talk about. It's one important thing to keep in mind. Leukoplakia is a clinical diagnosis, not a histopathological diagnosis. We realize this now, but we do still see some pathology reports where in the diagnostic line you have the histopathology is consistent with leukoplakia. That's not possible because leukoplakia is the clinical diagnosis 
and it's a diagnosis of exclusion in the clinical context, not a pathological diagnosis. A few pictures of how varying these things can look like in the oral cavity. You're looking at a leukoplakia of the cheek right there. And it's a very, very difficult place for the clinician. You should be very careful. Take some time to have a thorough inspection of the lateral surface of the tongue. Uh, you're looking at an erythematous plaque on the lateral surface of the tongue. These can be very subtle. and These have a higher chance of malignant transformation. So thorough oral examination should involve lateral surface of the tongue. And sometimes it can be a combination of white and red and atrophic area. And now you see the classic oral submucous fibrosis with the pallor and fibrous bands, with the difficulty in opening the mouth as far as the patient is concerned. And then you have proliferative varicose leukoplakia, this is one of our recent cases, where you have leukoplakia extensively throughout the oral cavity. Many a time, these are not associated with habit, and treatment is a clinical nightmare, and you need to have good follow-up and treat each patient based upon how these leukoplakias look like and whether they have any clinical indication of malignant transformation. Now, this is a very interesting group of lesions. I'll not talk much about it because Professor Roshna is going to talk about it in detail. This is varicose hyperplasia. The problem here is most of the times when we get the biopsy, the surgeon or the clinician is convinced that this is cancer, either a varicose cancer or a chronic carcinoma. But after multiple repeated biopsies and repeated histopathological examination, there is almost no or negligible invasion into the underlying connective tissue, which is the important criteria for malignant in this, uh, invasion. So these things are very tricky to handle. Uh, we're starting to see them in increasing numbers of late. And uh, these need a thorough understanding of the process. And I think Professor Roshna will talk about it. These are the lesions which really scare me or should get any clinician. These are three lesions taken over a period of time from different sources. On the upper left, you see a leukoplakia on the ventral surface of the tongue. On the right, you see an erythematous area of the uh, next to the mandibular alveolar ridge, the submandibular sub gland, ductal ridge, and right and at the bottom, you see a boggy swelling resembling a gingivitis around the upper central intestine. The problem is, all these three were known to be squamous cell carcinoma after biopsy. So this was my point earlier on in the flow diagram or the flow cartoon which I had put up. Sometimes, OPMDs, when they present, are not just pre-cancer, but the cancer, by the time you see them in the oral cavity. Therefore, you have to biopsy all oral potentially malignant disorders. There's no two ways about it. Now, this is a question which you have to answer the clinician and answer the patient. Which OPMD will become cancer? There are certain factors for the risk of malignant transformation. One, gender. the longer the duration, the higher the chance of malignant transformation. Paradoxically, leukoplakia non-smokers are more likely to become malignant than those in smokers. Sight, tongue, floor of the mouth, and soft palate carry an increased risk of malignant transformation. Sight, lesions greater than 200 square millimeter, carry an increased risk of malignant transformation. Clinical appearance to some extent. For example, erythroplakia. Uh, what I always consider is, if you look at an erythroplakia, they are cancers unless you disprove it using a biopsy. So when it is erythroplastic, when it is verrucous, when it is very thick, when it is proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, then they carry a higher risk of malignant transformation. But of all these factors, the current gold standard to ascertain if a lesion is malignant or going to become malignant or not is epithelial dysplasia. Epithelial dysplasia is currently the gold standard by which you ascertain if a particular lesion is going to be malignant or going to transform into malignant. And to understand dysplasia, you need to do biopsy. 
and biopsy is the gold standard at this point in time to diagnose malignancy and the risk of malignant transposition. Depending upon the lesion and the coordination with the clinical presentation, you could do an incisional biopsy or an excisional biopsy. And the tissue which you biopsy can be graded for dysplasia. The higher the grade of dysplasia, the higher the chance of malignant transformation, and you can manage your treatment protocol corresponding. Now, this is where things become tricky. There are numerous ways of grading dysplasia. Uh, you have the WHO system, the WHO over a period of time, the latest one is 2017. We have a system followed by the Japanese Society of Oral Pathology. And this is just a comparison and you have the reference at the bottom. I'm not going to go into each of them in detail. So these three are important. Current WHO classification, widely followed. Alabama classification. Uh, this is potentially a classification of pre-cancer or potentially malignant disorders in the larynx. Talk a little bit about them because some pathologists do prefer to use that. And the binary system. And the binary system is gaining popularity uh, because there are some inherent limitations of the WHO system, which we'll talk in a few minutes. And it is it has been proposed that the binary system to some extent can overcome uh, the disadvantages or the pitfalls in the WHO system. Quickly about the Ljubljana classification, you have four grades, uh, what's called simple hyperplasia, basal or parabasal hyperplasia, prototypical hyperplasia, and carcinoma in situ. And this is used for lesions of the larynx and the oropharyngeal region. But what is interesting is the clinical correlation with the histopathological diagnosis. And this benefits the practitioner. So what is simple hyperplasia is considered as benign or low risk. What is basal or parabasal hyperplasia is considered also as benign or low risk. Atypical hyperplasia is considered as potentially malignant. And carcinoma in situ is considered as malignant. So this gives the practitioner an idea of what to do when the diagnosis is either simple or basal hyperplasia or atypical hyperplasia or carcinoma in situ. So this is very useful in the clinical context. Coming to the grading of this patient using the WHO 2000, this is the classification followed widely. It takes into account three factors. One, the architecture of the epithelium. Two, the cellular RTPR within the surface of epithelium, and three, the thickness to which the cellular and architectural changes involve the mucus. So architecture, the thickness of involvement, and cellular RTPR. These three factors are taken into consideration to actually grade the dysplasia. This is a huge list. Uh, I'm not going to go completely into it, so all of you are aware of this. <coughs> So you have the architectural changes on the left. This is from the WHO 2005 classification and the cytological changes on the right. And what, is, what did I mean by the thickness of the change? If you divide the surface epithelium into one third, lower, mm -hmm. the middle and the upper, the changes are restricted to the lower one third. It's called mild. Goes on to the middle two thirds, it's called water. It involves the entire epithelium, then it is called CD. So you use a combination of the cellular changes, the architectural changes, and to what depth in the epithelium or what is the level of involvement in the surface epithelium. So you put all these three together in an algorithm, and then you arrive at what type of dysplasia it is. But there is a problem. Because you're using three factors, the architecture, the cytology, and the thickness of involvement, a lot of combinations are possible. For example, in this particular, this is from Professor Vannakula Surya's article in General of Oral Path and Medicine, a very interesting example. There is severe architectural change restricted to the lower one. The cellular atypia is moderate, but we still call it moderate dysplasia, though the changes are exclusively present in the lower one-third. 
which technically should be a mild dysplasia. But because the cellular urticaria and the architectural change is moderate and severe respectively, but the thickness is still lower one third, we still go ahead and call it moderate dysplasia. There's a little bit of an ambiguity and the question of subjectivity comes at this point in time. Another example, the architectural change is up to the middle one and there is severe cellular urticaria. So we call it severe dysplasia though the entire thickness of the epithelium is not involved because the cellular epithelium is severe. So I think you're, you get a drift of what I'm trying to convey here. Though the dysplasia grading is based on architecture, cellular epithelium, and to what level they are, lower one third mild, up till the middle two thirds moderate, and the entire severe, we do not follow it strictly in some situations where the severity of the architecture and the cellular features tend to be more moderate. Yeah. So question of subjectivity enters into the grading of this measure. To overcome this, one of the methods which was suggested was using the binary system. The binary system collapses the PTO system of the WHO and it gives it as low risk and high risk. And so this to some extent is presumed to alleviate the problem of Subjectivity, which sort of creates them, like in the examples which I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Muller's article in Triplo. Uh, on the left, you have a WHO classification of mine. Carcinoma in situ is removed in the 2017 classification. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. The binary splits it into low grade and high grade dysplasia. So the mild, moderate, severe, and carcinoma in situ are compressed into these two grades, low-grade dysplasia and high-grade dysplasia. Now this is the comparison, mild, moderate, and severe in WHO, the binary system which is low and high. You can see that the ambiguity or the problem comes in moderate dysplasia. Some of the moderate dysplasia will go into the low grade. Some of the moderate dysplasia will go into high grade. So how do you decide that? How do you decide which goes into low grade, which goes into high grade? There are two ways you can follow. One is uh, the cutoff point by Kuya et al. It says that you need four architectural and five cytological changes to shift from low to high grade. Or you could use the Nankivel et al. criteria, which states that if there are four architectural and four cytological changes, that will differ between low grade and the so, the idea of the binary system is to avoid the subjectivity which may creep in in some cases when you use the WHO 2017. And how does the binary system address this? It collapses it into two systems, low grade and high grade, and gives you a clear idea how do you differentiate it? Can you use either co architectural and five cytological changes or if you use the non trivial system? Architecture and post-cytological. So there is an element of objectivity which has been introduced, making it more reproducible between two investigators or two pathologists. Okay, let's talk about the WHO classification, which almost all of us use at this point in time. What has changed in the new classification since 2015? What has been removed? In the architectural changes, the basal cell hyperplasia has been removed. In cellular changes, the increase in nuclear size has been removed. What has been added? You have loss of epithelial cell cohesion which has been added in the architectural changes. So how does the system compare with the two earlier systems or how has the WHO 2017 evolved? In 2005, you had hyperplasia, mild, moderate, severe dysplasia, and in situ. In 2017, you either have no dysplasia, you have mild, you have moderate, and you have severe dysplasia. Satnoma in situ has been assumed into the category of severe dysplasia. So that changes when you compare to the 2005 classification. <clears throat> As I said, the diagnostic dilemma is the subjectivity in the WHO 2017 classification. And depending upon which study you look at, it can be, the can be as low as 0.15 or as high as 0.70. 
there is intra observer and intra observer variability and the factors that influence them are subjectivity like i said inflammation presence or absence of inflammation the site of the biopsy and the amount of tissue you are given to make a diagnosis all those can influence how you grade the dysplasia in a given space <clears throat> so in addition to the binary system what is there any other way to remove the subjectivity among pathologists and make it more objective this is the old favorite picture of mine taken way back from the new england journal of medicine but actually very relevant even today what it shows is as the mucosa progresses from normal to hyperplasia to dysplasia to tumor to metastasis an alteration of distant molecular markers and you get genetic alteration and there is an increasing genomic sequence you can look at these clubs of dysplasia and have a fairly accurate estimation of which lesion is going to become malignant and which lesion may not progress into malignancy that quickly uh this slide is from my colleague uh, dr pankaj <clears throat> Very interesting slide I saw in one of his presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as the mucosa progresses from normal to potentially malignant to cancer, you see histological changes, and this happens over a period of 10 to 15 years. And you also see genetic changes, and you also see molecular changes, and you see alterations of protein products like cyclin and EGFR and other molecules. So. the solution is look at the clinical picture look at the histopathology and if you have access like most of us do have access now especially to immunohistochemistry or molecular markers or genetic markers which may become an order of the day in a few years and you can plug all these two all these three together and your prognostication becomes very very accurate uh So a bit more complex than that. This is from a recent article by Nikitaki et al. from Poland Macular Facial Pathology, 2018. Look at the number of alterations going on. It's huge bunch of alterations. Now the question comes: What do we focus on? Where do we focus on? Are there some things we can use to start with? Yes. There are certain early markers, genetic events, which are indicative of malignant transformation. It's approximately as a rule of thumb said that there may be around five oncogenic events. Around P53 alterations or mutations may be one of the earliest things that can happen. Followed by alterations of chromosomes three, nine, and seventeen. Subsequently, eight, eleven, thirteen, and eighteen. And then you have a bunch of others taking on as the lesion progresses towards malignancy, including P21, P16, which is associated with HPV. P63, P73 belongs to the same family as P53. The CGF alpha and EGF alpha which belong to the epidermal growth factor group of families. And there are a lot of techniques which can, you can use. You can use microsatellite-based genetic analysis, LOH, DNA plotting, immunohistochemistry, fluorescence and microarrays. Microarrays are the in thing now, very expensive, but you have access to them. You can assess in multiple markers, single go. Of patients, but what is really acquiring clinical relevance are the two which I have highlighted: loss of heterozygosity and DNA plagiarism. There are numerous studies which are coming out which shows that these can actually be used clinically, routinely, along with your histopathology to find out which lesions are at risk. Let me give you two examples. Uh, this is an article by Liu et al. And triple O, uh, they took low risk lesions, low risk for potentially malignant disorder, and they studied what is called LOH, a loss of heterozygosity, to ascertain molecular risk. They had a very elegant model. Chromosome nine, we look for LOH. If there is retention, we move on to chromosome three P fourteen. Again, if there is retention, you say it's a low risk lesion. Whereas if you have LOH, a loss of heterozygosity in nine, you look for 17 P13 marker. If there is retention, it's intermediate risk. If that also shows LOH, it becomes higher risk. So accumulation of LOH of loss of 
because I got it particularly in chromosomes 9, 3 in the loci, which I have shown in this slide, and 17 can actually be used to ascertain which of the lesions or which of the leukoplakias which look very similar, which of them are low risk, which of them are intermediate risk, and which are high risk. So it is possible to use LOH if you have access to the facility to actually supplement your histopathology information and manage the patient appropriately. Another exciting uh, field is after a small break because of controversies associated with some of one of the early articles which was published, this again gathering a lot of interest and momentum. And this is a very, very promising test or an examination or a procedure which you could do, measure the DNA content in the potentially malignant disease. Now this figure actually is from the article by Zain et al. And I have the reference right there in scientific report. This is the case of moderate epithelial dysplasia that had a diploid DNA content, a diploid gene. Oh, the risk of malignant transformation is slightly less. Whereas this is the mild dysplasia with an aneuploid content. You can see the two peaks right there. Which means even though histopathologically you would diagnose it as mild dysplasia, the DNA ploidy analysis very clearly shows that it carries an increased risk of malignant transformation. Similarly, this is a moderate dysplasia with aneuploidy. So when you compare the first slide and the last slide, you have a moderate dysplasia with diploidy, and you have a moderate dysplasia with aneuploidy. Obviously, the latter has to be treated more aggressively, has to be followed up more periodically, has to be managed overall a little bit more quickly and aggressively. So the, these two, the last of heterozygosity and ploidy or DNA ploidy analysis may eventually become very useful clinical tool to supplement your clinical judgment of the lesion, your histopathological evaluation of the dysplasia, supplement it with LOH and flow cytometry or DNA ploidy analysis, you can probably group all the patients that you see into either low risk or high risk and manage appropriately. But do remember that in all these battle of trying to look at the DNA, look at the DNA ploidy status, what is becoming very evident is you have epigenetic changes also. There may be changes in the non-coding DNA, which may actually be pushing the cell towards the neoplasm or a neoplastic transformation. And that is gathering a lot of interest. Epigenetics was coined by Conrad Waddington, and it deals with heritable alteration in the gene expression, which are unrelated to the DNA sequence. It could be DNA methylation, histone modification, ATP-dependent chromatin remodeling, or what is really, really a lot of work, non-coding, RNA-mediated gene silence. That's just not theory. Let's look at this recent article which was published in Oral Maxillofacial Pathology by the same group which I showed you a few minutes back. So all these talk about a summary of the markers that you see in brain cancer, potentially malignant disease. A lot of LOH DNA body right there on the top of the tabular column. A lot of other markers. But look at the epigenetic events. Look at how much of the epigenetic events have been identified. So this is becoming a very, very exciting field. So what is the thing in the molecular pathology or basic research which is going to reach clinical translation probably in the near future? LOH analysis or loss of heterozygosity analysis, DNA ploidy status, and analysis of epigenetic events, particularly DNA methylation, microRNA, and histone modification. So these will have a lot of clinical application, and they're not just basic pieces. Okay, how do we put all these together? So this is what we've been talking about in the past few minutes. All of them do not become cancer. Are there any factors that you can set? Yes, there are clinical factors, histological factors, and molecular factors. How do you put all of them together? This is from the article by Spike and Sublo. Out for rows in 2017. Very interesting. This is a very, very useful tabular column. Let me take you through that quickly. So you have clinical features and histological features. What are a strong indicator of malignant transformation? 
Medium and heat. No, greater than 200 millimeter square, non homogeneous, red, that is erythroplakia or speckle, and if it occurs in the tongue or the floor of the mouth, a strong risk of malignant transformation. Female and greater than five years, a moderate risk. Non smoker, a weak risk, but higher than that in smokers. And of course, if it is the three tier system, if it classifies it as severe dysplasia, if it classifies it as a high risk in the two tier system, histologically, it has a strong risk of malignant transformation. Now, this is where all the excitement is the LOH, DNA ploidy analysis, HPV 16. So, all of you must be wondering why we're not spoken about HPV 16 or HPV 18, the high risk HPV tasks. A quick note, the first few slides when I mentioned that oral cancer is heterogeneous, I said oral cancer, oropharyngeal cancer, and cancer of the lip. Oral cancer is associated predominantly with habits like tobacco, arica nut, and other habits. Oropharyngeal cancer has got a high association with human papilloma. So it's very important to remember that it's the oropharyngeal cancer. I'm going to speak about two slides about HPV because no talk on precancer and cancer. I think is complete without talking about HPV. Quickly, so this is one of the latest publication which is out, which has got this guideline. This is based upon, this is by the Clinical Association of the American Pathology. About 2,200 peer reviewed articles, 492 studies were narrowed down. There are 14 recommendations, 14 important recommendations. But I'm going to talk about four, which summarizes most of these 14 recommendations. And it's important that as head and neck pathologists, we are aware of one high risk HPV testing or human papillomavirus testing is absolutely necessary on all newly diagnosed oropharyngeal carcinoma. If it is the newly diagnosed oropharyngeal carcinoma, it's absolutely necessary to do a test to ascertain if it is HPV positive. Second, High-risk HPV need not be routinely done on non-squamous carcinomas of the oropharyngeal region of the head. And so if it's a non-squamous carcinoma, you need not do HPV testing. First, which is a very important point, you needn't necessarily use HPV DNA integration like in-situ hybridization of PCR for HPV. It's not absolutely necessary for all lesions. P16 is sufficient. What does the recommendation say? P16 overexpression is strongly associated with transversely active high risk HPV in oropharyngeal cancer. So, P16 in oropharyngeal cancer can be used as a surrogate marker of high risk HPV infection. And the fourth point is if it is HPV positive or P16 positive as a surrogate marker, the tumor grade or tumor differentiation, differentiation status is not recommended. The differentiation really doesn't matter with low grade, high grade, highly characterized, non characterized because it all has a better prognosis. So if it is HPV positive, either by means of in situ or PCR, or that P16 as a surrogate marker, you don't nearly have to grade the lesion because the treatment protocol is different, the prognosis is different, and the patient behaves in a different way as far as morbidity and mortality is concerned. So, all oropharyngeal cancers, you need to do HPV investigation. You can do P16 as a surrogate marker for HPV in oropharyngeal carcinoma. And if it is HPV positive, you do not have to depend upon the grading to plan your treatment protocol. I just came in three days back. I got a message from one of the groups which um, we discussed about HPV. This you can see is June 15, 2020. In the US, it's just about Gardasil 9 for prevention of oropharyngeal head and neck cancer caused by HPV. So HPV has got a very, very strong etiological role in head and neck cancer. As far as the oral cavity is concerned, uh, we know that HPV is associated with dysplasias which have coilocytes, so-called coilocytic dysplasias. Those do not seem to carry a very high risk of uh, malignant transformation in the few studies which are out. But when it occurs in the oropharyngeal region, they carry a higher risk of malignant transformation. So we have all these data. You have the three-tier grading. 
you have the clinical features, you have the binary system, you have the molecular markers, which are very promising, like LOH or loss of heterozygosity, DNA ploidy analysis, epigenetic changes like DNA addict formations and silencing RNAs and microRNAs. And of course, HPV and oropharyngeal carcinoma. How do I put all these together? So this is an elegant algorithm, uh, which was published in JADA recently, in 2017. And uh, it shows the clinical algorithm you can follow. It's one of the recommendations by the American Dental Association for potentially malignant disorders. You have three subheadings. One, when you have no clinically evident lesion or symptom. Two, when it is clinically evident but seemingly innocuous, so you don't suspect malignancy. And three, it is clinically evident and you're suspicious that it may already be malignant or may transform very shortly to a malignancy like squamous cell carcinoma. And for all these is either you refer them to a specialist or do a biopsy. And then subsequently, there's an algorithm of uh, things that you could do. How this summarizes all that I've said in the last few minutes. All the three factors are important clinically when you talk about the potentially malignant disorder. When you look at the history, what lesions are suspicious, females carry a higher risk when it's greater than 50 years, non-smokers, sites such as tongue of, tongue of floor of the mouth, lateral surface or tongue of floor of the mouth, and lesions which are erythroplastic. In the case of leukoplakia, if it is non-homogeneous, either verrucous, speckled, or proliferative verrucous leukoplakia, or erythroplakia, the histology is done and it can be differentiated into mild, moderate, and severe, or low risk or high risk, depending on whether you use the PTO or the binary system. So, an evaluation of a potentially malignant disorder is just not a question of looking at the slide and saying whether it's mild, moderate, or severe dysfunction. Combination of looking at the history, features of the lesion, examination as to the type of the lesion, biopsy, and if you're doing research or you're following up a cohort for a particular study, incorporating molecular techniques like LOH, OID, DNA addict formation, uh, microRNAs, and HPV analysis. So, you've come a long way, it's just not eyeballing the dysplasia and saying, yeah, this may become malignant, this may not become malignant. We have an arsenal of tools available at our disposal where we can take the subjectivity of dysplasia, which is the current gold standard, the two limitations, address the limitations using molecular techniques, which are doable and that which are becoming very constant. And the whole idea of doing all this is not lose sight of the fact that the patient management is of utmost importance. So I screen patients for pre-malignancy cancer. It's not a question of diagnosis and management. You're getting a lot of personalized therapy which is coming into being. I'm sure you've all heard about use of drugs like metformin in leukoplakia and clinical trials to prevent leukoplakic progression use of biologicals like curcumin. So when you use these, you could use all the points which we discussed today, all the aspects we discussed today for a longitudinal evaluation of patients, the clinical aspect, the histology, and the molecular aspect. So oral potentially malignant disorders are not just leukoplasia and triplasia. Now we have with us the tools, the wherewithal, to subclassify them into various categories and keep them based on our classification, clinically, histologically, and at the molecular level. Let me stop here. And thank you very much once again. Sorry for the delay. Thank you all for joining us.